This is Tar Heel Talk, an in-depth look at the issues and people making news in North Carolina. Here's your host, Sonia Williams. At age 19, my guest today was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. After serving 17 years, he's now out of prison and on a mission to prevent other teens from heading down the wrong path. He is Mike Anderson, founder and CEO of Polished Souls, an organization designed to educate and empower at-risk youth. Mike, welcome to Tar Heel Talk. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me here at Tar Heel Talk. Now let's talk a little bit about your personal story. At age 14, you were living in the streets. Street you know, life, sitting, yeah. yeah. Street life, selling drugs, selling guns. What made a 14-year-old decide to, to live that lifestyle? Well, first and foremost, I would say that probably my environment I was exposed to things such as, you know, selling drugs as well as selling guns. Mm -hmm. I was in a violent environment, not just out in the streets, but in my home as well. Uh, I had a little dysfunctionalism that was going on within the household in reference to my father's behavior and things that were going on uh, within my uh, brother's behavior as well. So there was a lot of exposure that actually, uh, I would say, influenced me in a sense. And then when you're coming up, in society and you have a certain type of benchmark that's thrown in front of you in reference to materialistic things mm -hmm. as a teenager that's what you crave is materialistic things to look just as good as anybody else to you know be dressed just as good as anybody else and so I would say some of those things influenced me to actually go after quick money in a mm -hmm. sense and um, that's that's the gist of it. Okay, and what was that like for you as a 14-year-old? I'm thinking, you know, I have, I've had a 14-year-old, and, and you're really immature at that age. How, I guess you had to grow up quickly. Yeah, you definitely have, have to grow up quickly because, believe it or not, you put yourself around dangerous people, mm -hmm. not just dangerous people, but you put yourself in dangerous situations and things that can actually as we can tell, uh, take your life to another direction Absolutely. that is very negative. And one of the things that I can remember is when I first started, I actually started um, selling marijuana in school. And, you yeah. know, I'm not just the only 14-year-old that has an interest in marijuana, so to speak, because absolutely, if I'm selling it, then there's somebody that's interested in it as well right. in the school. So it was just one of those things that when you get involved with that type of behavior, it's almost, how can I say, do or die. Mm -hmm. And some of us don't have the, the the slightest notion that die is quicker than do. <laughs> right, right. But when you were 19, there was one particular incident that changed your whole life. It yeah. started as an argument or fist fight in a park and exactly. took a, a very and, uh, tragic turn. It was actually two situations, mm -hmm. you know, and lo and behold, there's a lot of things that should have prevented me from being right here on this show today. But uh, one of the situations actually happened when I was 18 where I was involved with a gun sale that was used in the murder and then I was actually uh, charged with that at 18. I was uh, put into the Cumberland County Jail and put in a 25, under a $25,000 bond for okay. second degree murder. I actually posted bail on that when I got out. For some reason I just kept on making the wrong decisions. Then got involved with that situation seven months later when there was a fist fight that escalated into a shootout so to speak and ended up getting charged with first degree murder. So I was in a situation that I was facing the death penalty plus life plus 20 plus 20 plus 20 years and that had a lot to do with making the wrong decisions and putting myself in the wrong environments around the wrong people. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you when you were given at 19 that life sentence? What did you think? <laughs> well, you know, if you think about it, you actually, when you're involved in, in, in waiting for trial, you are put in a jailhouse. You are put in there not just with people that have been in there for their first time, but people that have been in there the second time, the third time. So you're hearing all sorts of stories. Mm -hmm. You're hearing stories where, hey, this might be over with for you so you might as well just go ahead and get used to doing life in prison or whatever and it's one of those things that you say my future is gone and when you think your future is gone you you, you start uh, to in retrospect think of everything that you could have done mm -hmm. to prevent it everything that you could have done to put yourself in better situations and circumstances and it becomes more intimidating to the fact that it's never going to be uh, pleasurable for you. It's, it's never going to be a life that you can say, you know what, I'm enjoying life. 
you're about to go to prison. You're about to be behind bars. You're about to be somewhere where there's frowns every day, mm -hmm. where there's attitudes every day. And there's an infinite amount of personalities that affect you in a very negative way. Right. So it's, it's not a good feeling at all. Mm -hmm. Now, once you are in prison, how was the transition for you? Because you were, you were in the game and you, I'm sure, were surrounded by people who also had done some of the things that you did on the outside. What was it for you? How did you make that transition and decide, I don't want to live like this anymore? Well, something hit me one day. I was reading um, As a Man Thinketh by James Allen, and the book actually had a phrase in there that was talking about, you can think your way out of certain circumstances because if you create a positive mind frame, it allows you to think positive every day. And I knew that one day I woke up, I had a dream before I woke up, and that dream was showing me on stages, it was showing me uh, doing performances, it was showing me during, doing certain types of artistic projects and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then there was a second dream I had that actually uh, entailed a bunch of hands coming out of a, a closet doorway when I was walking down a dimly lit hallway and I heard a lot of like young voices saying help me help me help me and then it was then that I woke up and I started realizing that you know what I don't think it's over with for my life I think I'm going back home and I would say that to counselors and programmers and they'd be like what what are you talking about Do you realize <laughs> your charges you got a life sentence and so on and so forth and I'm like you know I this certain type of confidence and faith overcame me because I knew God had given me that vision that it's not over with Mm -hmm. And a lot of people would have felt like, no, it's over for you, Mr. Anderson. And, and, and it was then that transition began that said, okay, well, if this is what's going to happen, if this is the dream that's given to me, guess what? I have to prepare for it. I have to equip myself with it. I have to find every tool that is necessary to become this better man that I'm supposed to be once I step out. Absolutely, and that's exactly what you did. You took advantage of every opportunity given to you. You earned two degrees. Yes, ma'am. In college, I mean, in in prison. In prison. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about um, some of the things that you did while you were in prison to to better yourself and to help other inmates. Well, one of the things that I got involved with was it's somewhat similar to a scared straight program, where we spoke to juvenile delinquents that would come in that were on probation or parole. We would give them an uh, understanding of what it was like on the inside and counsel them before they went back out from this actual program. Um, some of the things I got involved with, I got uh, my associate's degree in business administration, got my associate's degree in computer systems technology. I uh, had several different trades that I took up like plumbing, HVAC, uh, brick masonry, the nine different trades that I actually uh, mm -hmm. took advantage of. There was a lot of self-help programs that I took advantage of like Napoleon Hills, uh, success program, uh, several other programs, and you know, that was a uh, cognitive behavior, you know, to be aware of what your behavior was. To kind of self-monitor yourself so that you realize that, hey, if I'm going to be positive, I need to uh, conduct myself in a positive way. And so many other programs that I got involved with, uh, things that were honing my talents and my skills, talent shows, and then as time went on, when I came to the point to where it was almost time to go home, got involved with uh, home passes, uh, community visit passes. I had mm -hmm. two wonderful people that became my sponsors that actually believed, well, three actually, you know, one, uh, two of those people were actually Gabriel and Mary DeHarnay, and then there was Chuck Davis, of course. Wow, with the African American Yeah, dance I became ensemble. his poet one day, wow, and uh, I was coming out, <laughs> coming out on uh, passes performing at his shows as a poet. So there were so many things that just started uh, transitioning into what I saw in those dreams. Mm -hmm. Now, poetry Writing poetry is one of your passions. Exactly. How, how did you connect with Chuck Davis? He's he is one of my idols. Well, uh, while I was on the inside, I had actually written like 13 books. And I was like really, really in tune with my poetry self because I was doing the talent shows. I would perform in two different categories. I had a little rap group in there, and then we, I would do poetry by myself. But one day I came out on a pass, and I had met him at the Durham Arts Council. and. He, he, he approached me and he said, there's something about you. He said, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to write a poem about the accounting, which is an actual instrument that was the predecessor to the banjo. He was creating a production called Bluegrass Brown Earth, which was fusing bluegrass music with African dance. He said, if you can research this accounting and write a poem about it, I want you to take, he wrote down his number, said, I want you to call this number and actually uh, recite the poem to me. So. The next night, I went home, and, I mean, home, prison, went back to the uh, prison cell, actually wrote the poem. And probably within about an hour and a half, I called him back after I wrote the poem, and I recited it to him. 
and he it kind of like blew him away and he was like I cannot believe that you just you know wrote that he loved the piece and then mm -hmm. before you know it I became the poet in residence for AADE Wow, and, and that is quite an honor. Chuck Davis, it is he, an he honor. is an influential man in, not just in the Durham community, but North Carolina as North a whole. Carolina, um, uh, and I the would world. say the world. Yeah, and, and say in, <laughs> in the, the world, world, all yeah. over to Africa. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Absolutely. he definitely, it was an honor to actually be his poet. And um, the two sponsors that I had mentioned that were taking me away from, com uh, from the prison for community visits, uh, Gabe and Mary, they were so supportive. They believed in me as well. And you know, that's the key thing. When people that get behind you and believe in you, it allows you to believe in yourself even more so. Right. Well, we're going to take a break, and we'll talk more in just a minute. Okay. Right. We'll be back with more of Mike Anderson's story after these messages. I'm talking today with Mike Anderson. At age 19, he was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. He served 17 years of that sentence and is now out of prison and on a mission to help other at-risk youth through his organization, Polished Souls. Polished Souls uses the arts as a way to reach today's youth. Mike, thank you again for being with us. Thank you. It's definitely a pleasure. Now, before the break, you were talking about the sponsors that you had on the outside and that support that helped you to pursue your dreams and eventually get out of prison. I want to talk a little bit about how you managed to get out because you were serving a life sentence and usually life means, means life. life. Yeah. Um, um, well, there was a possibility for parole and due to the fact that I uh, obtained a uh, model inmate status, okay. uh, infraction free the whole 17 years mm -hmm. and the multitude of uh, scholastic programs that I had achieved, the parole board actually came at me and said, look, we're going to give you another chance. There was this thing mm -hmm. called a MAP program, which is a mutual agreement parole plan and what it is is a gradual process of allowing the person to transition back into society as I said I was going out on passes that's a way of uh, re-exposing you back to the environment of society and I also started a work release program I was actually working for um, H&T distributors out in Hillsboro North Carolina and mm -hmm. that gave me the opportunity to somewhat build capital so I could prepare myself to come home and I actually when I came home I moved into my own apartment and was wow. able to start off you know, start afresh and start new and, and, and get ready to be the person of society that I wanted to be. Right. Now, how did you manage to not fall back into your old lifestyle? Because a lot of times when people are released from prison, it is very easy to go back to the way you were living before. How did you make the transition without going back? Well, I, I chose um, to actually not go back home. And that has a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't put yourself around the same people that you left. Absolutely. And not just that, but I think I was already determined regardless. Uh, you know, there was mistakes that I, that I could have made. There was decisions that I could have made when I came home. The thoughts were entertained at the same token. You know, I'm, to be real and be transparent, because a lot of mm -hmm. people will try to say they're perfect, but I know in all actuality, my right. thoughts were never perfect. But it's the thoughts that I, you know, chose to follow, the decisions that I chose to make that allowed me to continually uh, move on in a successful pattern. Um, one of the things that, you know, I didn't go back to Fayetteville. I, I, instead, I moved to a place that was conducive for me and my quest for the arts. And, I, you know, uh, Durham and Raleigh is an artistic area, mm -hmm. and it has a lot more to offer than, the, you know, the place that I, I was from. Uh, I put myself in a position so where I can work my way into society with every determined <laughs> thought that I can possibly apply to society. I, right. You know, get out here, publish my books, get out here and become involved with performances. Mm -hmm. Do uh, And you have two books. That yeah, I actually right do. Um, one of the books is entitled um, The Lost Disciple, God's Revelations to a Street Poet. And what I did was I took a uh, biblical scripture and I turned it into something that was relative to street life. Mm -hmm. um, I, in other words, David might be, you know, somebody that was an adulterer or whatever and somebody that was uh, involved with infidelity in the streets. Uh, Moses, you know, was somebody that might have been <laughs> uh, related to a thug or whatever that had uh -huh. got involved with things, but still God used them to show that people, even though you're a lost disciple, God is still willing to use you. And the other book is entitled Serenity in the Dark, which is a book of poems and proverbs and a short story. And that just explains that you can find serenity 
eternity in the darkness. You know, it, it brings you to that point in life that no matter how dark your present may be, your future can involve serenity, which is peace. Right. And now you're making your debut on the on the big screen um, with yeah. your film, <laughs> yeah. so to speak. Yeah, it's entitled Stray, and it's mm -hmm. actually a short film that was designed for at-risk youth to uh, teach them about gun violence. And what okay. STRAY is, is an acronym that stands for Showing Truth, Reaching All Youth. Mm -hmm. And I want to take this into the schools and actually present it so that it can become a part of Project Exposure, which is actually a, a camp that I want to do in the mountains. Okay, okay. Now we have a little clip of STRAY. Um, we don't have the audio, but the video, if you can kind of tell us what we're seeing in okay. that video, um, then we can get a better understanding I can of, definitely of do that. I can is. definitely do that. Okay, what you have here is Dasana Hanu, which was a great actor in this uh, film. He is on the corner getting ready to sell some drugs, and he's making a transaction with Edwin Lewis, which was also the cameraman behind this uh, film. And uh, what you have here right now is uh, the deaf angel warning Dasana Hanu about Stray. Mm -hmm. And as uh, the deaf angel walks away, what you can actually see, it slows down. You hear the heartbeat, and this is where the tragedy happens. And uh, Rashan, which is the uh, character that Dasana Hanu plays, mm -hmm. actually gets shot. Now here, if you can see the smoke clearing, right. we're inside the head of the drug dealer right now. And this is the bullet. And the bullet is actually getting ready to present, you know, uh, a monologue to the drug dealer. He's telling him, you could have been anything. You could have been a lawyer. You could have been a, a doctor, an athlete. But you chose to be a stupid um, drug dealer. And he's letting them know that, hey, I'm getting ready to take you out. I know that you're about to leave behind some loved ones. But this is your choice. Mm -hmm. This is the choice you made. And uh, due to the fact that gun violence reigns supreme in the streets, right. I'm going to take you out. Mm -hmm. And that's a powerful message that you, and you will use this video as a teaching tool with youth. Talk a little bit about that project and, and how that will work. Well, what Project Exposure is, what I want to do is take this, this short film into any school that allows me to come into it. Mainly your alternative schools, because for some reason, alternative yeah. schools are where they say, I'll throw away youth is supposed to be. And I can't stand that word, because nothing is meant to be thrown away. Because what the slogan is behind Polish shows is that every diamond in the rough is a soul that deserves to be polished. So as I go into these schools with this short film, I will present it. I will pose an essay contest. One of the main questions that I want to pose is, what wrong decision did Rashan, the main character, make? And what could he have done to not make that decision, to make mm -hmm. things better for him, for this tragedy not to happen? My top ten, uh, it's not really going to be ten, it's going to be seven essayists that will win because I have this theme from 17 to 17s, so that I can go from 17 years to taking 17s into the trailblazer mm -hmm. program of Project Exposure, take them into the mountains, have like a four to five day empowerment retreat, and uh, give them workshops such as how to be a leader in a world full of followers, how to take your illegitimate hustles and turn them into legitimate hustles, have some poetry workshops, and then aside from all that, to go hiking and expose them to an environment that they've never been you know exposed to because you'd be surprised some of these youth never been out their backyard or off right. the street corner that they're on right now and I actually just want to give them the opportunity to learn what it is to see bigger things you know the mountains to me is something that represents a big vast creation that you can see almost for infinity mm -hmm. and so if you give them that vision of infinity they should be able to strive for whatever it is that they have in their minds as, as dreams objectives and goals mm -hmm. Absolutely. How can people find out more information about you and Polished Souls? Well, I have a website. It's uh, Polished Souls, and that's one word, P-O-L-I-S-H-E-D-S-O-U-L-S dot -S com. Or they can reach me at 919-672-6015. I do motivational speaking. I also try to do at-risk youth counseling any, you know, in any uh, environment that they want me to come to. I'm trying to take Polished Souls to international because I know they're everywhere and if you know how people say they want to franchise a business I want to franchise polished souls because I believe again every diamond in the rough is a soul that deserves to be polished and mind you that when you have a diamond in the rough let's say it's in the cold before it's even formed and it takes pressure to form that diamond. Mm -hmm. There's all types of pressure. That, there's societal pressure, there's peer pressure, and then there's self-pressure. Because we can be harder on ourselves sometimes than anybody else oh, can. Right. Sure. So I definitely want to make sure that we take this pressure and create the diamonds that we are to create out of these at-risk and troubled behavior youth. Okay, well we're going to take another break and talk more in just a minute. Okay. Don't go away. Tarhill Talk will continue after these messages.
Welcome back to Tar Heel Talk. I'm Sonia Williams. We're talking today with Mike Anderson. At age 19, Anderson was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. After serving 17 years, he's now out of prison and working, and he also has a family and a message to share with at-risk youth through his organization, Polished Souls. Mike, thank you again for being with us today. You. Now, you've been out of prison for three and a half years now, yes. and yes. you're married with yes. a family. Life is good for you. Life is actually awesome. Um, it's not perfect, but it's awesome. You know, <laughs> It's uh, one of those things that you look back, and, and, and in retrospect, you say, wow. Um, I never, I never expected this, and nor did I feel like I deserved it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I'm married uh, to the lovely Lawanda Lee Anderson, and we just had our first child in um, July. His name is Malachi Elijah Anderson. Oh, sweet. Which he's actually inspiring my next book that I'm getting ready to work on, which is actually my life story. It's, mm -hmm. it's going to be called The Book of Malachi, because uh, biblically, if you, if, if you can recall, Malachi was the f uh, last book of the Old Testament. And so the last book of the Old Testament, my Old Testament, brings me into the New Testament, which is Malachi. Absolutely. Now, you have been blessed, no doubt, with a second chance at life. Definitely. And the other side of this is, you know, not everyone gets a second chance. I know um, some people in there that just, that's, that, right. you know, it, it just seems like it's not going to happen for them. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of those things that, even though it seems like that, I would always like to say, never give up. Right. Now, the the man that the young man that you shot and killed was also 19 at the time. He was, was no, was actually he, uh, 17. He was 17. Yeah, 17. He was 17 at the time. How often do you think of him? Every day. Um, I think of him every day because, from what I understand, there was a a child left behind. But um, it's just one of those things that uh, you you try not to condemn yourself with it, but mm -hmm. at the same token, you allow it to motivate you to look back. Um, and to give back and to just think back about things, how you could have changed that day. If, if there was something, you know, if everybody could have just said, stop, we're doing the wrong thing, but it just escalated to something that uh, one thing led to another, you know, lives were threatened. And then before you know it, um, my reaction was based upon, you know, not just fear of my life, but for my best friend's life as mm -hmm. well that day. Because you weren't the only one with the gun no, on that no, day. It, there were. Yeah, it was like guns against guns. Mm -hmm. So it was just one of those things that um, it, it, it could have stopped. It, it could have been stopped, but nobody was thinking. Um, and then everything was like a reaction that was simultaneous. Mm -hmm. And when you look back on it, 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 it hurts to know that you contributed to something where somebody lost their life. Um, but again, condemnation, there's no room for that. And you try to move on and give back in a different way that will actually save lives now Absolutely. instead of take them. Now, as you talk with today's youth, what message are you sharing with them that will stick? Something that they will remember? Because a lot of times we have people who kind of preach to our, our exactly. teenagers and it doesn't go very far. What message do you share that will stay with them? Well, one of the things, uh, as a poet, I sometimes rhyme with my messages. And one of the things I say is do your best and not less. And a lot of people don't realize that you can do your best and not be perfect. And we, as a society, has, we have a tendency to sugarcoat things. Mm -hmm. And we never present it as a, 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 a reality. We like to say, okay, this is the scholarly perspective versus the real perspective. You know, a scholar can tell you how to live, but until they live the life that you live, they can't show you from experience. And one of the things I like to use is my life story testimony and say, look, these decisions are what led to this. This is the message. If you, <laughs> you know, I didn't have to make it out. I could have stayed in there for life. So if you make some of the same decisions that I made in the past, this is where it's going to get you. And you may not make it out. So don't take that chance. Don't take a risk and become at risk. Absolutely. And people can contact you by? Going to the website. It has all my information on there. I have email information on there. They can go to polishedsouls.com. That's P-O-L-I-S-H-E-D-S-O-U-L-S.com. And also, you can reach me by phone, 919-672-6015. Mike Anderson, founder and CEO of Polished Souls. We thank you so much for taking oh, the you. time to share this very personal and powerful story with us. And thank you for all that you're doing for our young people today. Thank you. And thank you for the support. All right. That's it for this week's Tar Heel Talk. To comment on this or other episodes of the show, send us an email at tarheeltalk at fox50.com. I'm Sonia Williams. Thanks for watching. Enjoy your week.